I think that we're a very warlike nation, actually. I think the, the British have been best over the years at, at war. And I think motor racing is war. It's, it's the same spirit. It's the team spirit of a group of people pulling together to beat somebody else. We're not trying to kill them, but we are trying to beat them by whatever means we have at our disposal. And we go through the same secrecy and, and techniques of deceit and trying to make people think that if we've, for example, discovered a new wing, that we've actually done a new rear suspension geometry so that they don't actually sort out why we're going quicker if we are, for example. That's the sort of thing. I think the British are very warlike and they're actually rather good at, at going to war and I think that's perhaps the reason why they're quite good at motor racing. <laughs> It's a man's sport, isn't it, really? Getting your hands dirty and... I don't know. It's not the motor racing I find so interesting, it's the actual work in, a, in amongst it. That's the... Uh, a lot of satisfaction in the work that you do. Watching the car go around and thinking that your work's involved in that car, perhaps finishing and winning. Burger creeping a bit, Mantle gets away well. Position. At least you see an individual item actually winning at a track or whatever. There's a real sense of achievement there. You see an end product more, whereas on a production line you just do a part of a thing and that's it sort of thing. Here we complete a complete car all in the one workshop. Building racing cars is like model making on a grand scale. Trouble. You see, we get nicknamed Metal Bashes. You feel like that sometimes as well. My motor racing interest sort of stopped with Graham Hill and Jimmy Clark, really. takes over, it takes over your life completely. I mean, work here seven days a week sometimes, a lot of the time. I think I've had about three weeks, it ends off since Christmas. It's a world within a world. A world that seems to spring from boyhood passions for fiddling with mechanical things. A world that is often measured by the thickness of a cigarette paper. I, I'd made some bits for, for, for the car when I first came here, and I saw a bit crash and I saw a bit come off and my bit wasn't with the bit that came off so it must have broken you know that worried me a bit children had been playing the right games for centuries the adults just hadn't understood the games they've always come back to are the games of pure imagination the most progressive toys of today are really the old ones with subtle additions first of all they're designed to match the child's ability to manipulate them and even to make him want to handle them. Ideas cannot start until play begins. The actual physical handling of assorted materials of different shapes and sizes seems to lead directly to original experiments. The best of these toys consists of simple geometric shapes. The shapes are related to each other and these simple relationships also subtly introduce mathematics to the young child. And what would child psychologists make of the laconic understatement in this boy's own racing language? Blindingly fast cars are never fast, just quick. This type of catastrophe is simply a shunt. Causing a crash is merely naughty. Making a mistake is brain fade. Engineering failure, just finger trouble. Then there are the legends. For me, Jim Clark was the, the central figure of my teenage period. Everyone else was into the Beatles, I was into Jim Clark. And 
I used to go meet him at the airport whenever he came out to Australia, where I lived. And, and for me, Clark encapsulated everything that was good and great about racing drivers, and still does, in fact. Jim. <laughs> The promotional film, made in 1967, captures the last days before sponsorship transformed the cars into machines that didn't just cost money, but earned money. Benny is already gone, and Eamon closes the gap on Clark. McLaren checks the grass verge and Stewart returns to base. No let up in front, Clark leading Hill and then Eamon. It's always interested me, the fact that in actual fact, one car is quicker than another. And it's not because it's necessarily got a better driving or anything. It is actually, by its design and its engineering, a quicker car than another. And that fascinated me when I was at school. And I actually chose to study engineering at university rather than trying to go to medical school, in fact, simply because I wanted to design racing cars, and I thought it was fascinating. The public thinks of motorsport as being uh, Nigel Mansell, Alain Prost, uh, Michele Alboreto. And the constructors, the people in the business, think that those are really replaceable light bulbs. They have no interest in those people, whatever. Uh, they're interested in themselves and their own teams, uh, in winning, in gaining certain prizes, which, strangely enough, don't carry much of a cash reward. Uh, but they do carry the reward of success, and that success leads, of course, to money. But it's not just toys for the boys. They are expensive toys, and they, these are toys that spin more money. Formula One is a heady cocktail of superb technology, salaries measured in millions, strutting temperamental egos, and a deep undercurrent of male sexual domination. Only one driver ever admitted to me uh, that he had had an orgasm uh, the first time he went into a car from the sheer thrill of it. But I think the erotics of possession, uh, the erotics of domination, are, are very strong. And I suppose some of the strongest feelings that motivate and move inside the motor racing world are precisely who possesses whom, who is top dog, who's the man, who's the girl, uh, and uh, drivers who are a special breed anyway. I mean, you have to be quite mad to become a motor racing driver. Obviously feel they dominate it. I think from within a team like Williams, where we're 115 people, the drivers could quite accurately be, des be described as merely two employees of the company. And they are, of course, the tip of the iceberg when the cars are on the grid and the green light's on, and all the effort is down to the two guys in the cars doing the job. And, of course, they carry a lot of responsibility. But they're no better than the cars they drive. There was a time in, in what were the glamour days uh, when one team totally dominated motor racing, which was Mercedes-Benz. They came in, they won everything. And any season in which one team, one car wins anything is by definition a boring and a bad season for the spectator. März 1938. Die Rennsaison beginnt. Die Mercedes-Benz Rennkolonne verlässt die Tore des Werks zu neuen Kämpfen. Seit mehr als vier Jahrzehnten sind die Namen Daimler und Benz mit der Entwicklung des Autorennsports untrennbar. Today it is common practice for the teams and their sponsors to make films about their cars and their victories viele Jahre den absoluten Weltrekord der Geschwindigkeit. This production and its original soundtrack is perhaps the first professionally made promotional motor racing film. With its emphasis on concentrated power, organizational efficiency and its lilting tango rhythms, the film reflects perfectly the dawn of a new age of motor racing. Im Hafen von Neapel werden die Rennwagen behutsam ausgeladen um nach Tripolis verschifft zu werden.
For Mercedes-Benz, it is the machinery and the technology, not the drivers, that matter. Die Rennwagen, die hier vom Kran an Deck gehoben werden, sind eine völlig neue Konstruktion. Denn mit Beginn des Jahres 1938 ist an die Stelle der bisher gültigen sogenannten 750 Kilo Rennformel eine andere internationale The team shipping their toy-like cars from one Grand Prix battle to another is run like a dedicated army under the obsessive eye of Alfred Neubauer. Rennleiter Alfred Neubauer, der in aller Welt bekannte Stratege der Motorenschlachten, der technische Direktor Max Seiler, Europameister Rudolf Caracciola, Oberingenieur Uhlenhaut, der verantwortliche technische Betreuer der Mercedes-Benz Rennwagen, sie alle stehen vor der gleichen... Neubauer's organization was to be the model for motor racing from now on. Training heißt Forschungsarbeit. The enjoyable afternoon sport of Grand Prix racing was astonished and perhaps even outraged by this unsporting blitzkrieg. Victory, instead of fun, was now all that mattered. Unter Dutzenden von Brennstoffdüsen gilt es, die richtige Wahl zu treffen. Manfred von Brauchitsch folgt. These new German cars, as fragile and sophisticated as fighter planes, raised the stakes and the costs irreversibly, bestowing prestige and glory on their hidden sponsors, the Third Reich. Exactly half a century later, the paymasters change, but the theme is the same, domination. Today, in this slick promotional film, instead of thinly disguised national socialism and stormtrooping technology, it is a macho domination by the sponsor, Camel cigarettes over the market, through television, via the cars. In this case, a barely visible Lotus. There's a lot of swilling at the trough, a lot of competitive. It's like you put 12 piglets around, a lot of meal. Uh, they're all going to dive in head first. All of them live extremely well off sponsorship. It is true that a major part of the money goes into the product. It goes into gigantic salaries to drivers. Uh, it is only very recently, incidentally, that uh, engineers have been paid anything. I mean, I can remember the days when top flight engineers were making 20,000 or 30,000 pounds as against a million today. And that's in less than a decade. They've become important as technology developed. Basically, all of them live extremely well, and basically all of them do cream off the money for their way of living because they live on expenses. They live in perpetual travel and per perpetual research and development in perpetual marketing so that the companies are very ably organized. And I'm not saying that anybody's siphoning off money which should be put elsewhere. It is just such a, a complex mechanism to put together that the sponsor money necessarily goes into all sorts of things that if you were to look at it closely and you were in a university rather than uh, a motor racing team would be regarded as peculation, uh, frankly. There are 18 Formula One companies. Seven, including most of the best, are British. Several others, like Italian Ferrari or German Zakspeed, use many British engineers. In 1987, Williams Grand Prix Engineering, founded by Frank Williams 10 years earlier, won both the Constructors' Championship and the Drivers' Championship. Like most
most of the top teams, the Williams nationality is obscure, submerged beneath the heraldry of its international paymasters. Yet all the teams, and Frank Williams in particular, believe they are engineers fighting for Britain. If you asked him what colour he would like his cars to be, he would probably say, he would think and probably say dark blue, but he'd be weighing up against British racing green. Uh, were not either of those colours, were all those colours. And if you'd like to all come round, it's a good ch chance to have a look at the chassis. One of those colours is the huge American oil giant, Mobil. Part of the contract allows Mobil to tour the Williams Oxfordshire-based race shop with some of its favoured clients. And we can monitor the functions of the engine meanwhile... For Peter Windsor, it's a routine floor show. But for the visitors, and particularly for a sponsor like Mobil, it must be a memorable day out. Mobile pays Williams two and a half million dollars for a sticker on either side of Nigel Mansell and Ricardo Patrese's cars. But all is not well. The team is in crisis. Honda, their brilliant Japanese engine suppliers, have gone to another team after a row with Williams. The replacement engine that should have associated Mobile's product with total world domination is failing to deliver, despite Windsor's upbeat message. It was with the John Judd built Cosworth engine that we first ran the synthetic oil that we use even now. Deflecting the oil man's interest away from the engine, Windsor produces a scruffy piece of foam covered in sticky tape. It looks pretty grotty, but it is so because uh, it's molded to his uh, shape. It turns out to be Mansell's seat. Everything is designed to make him feel as comfortable and as secure as possible in the car. It's one thing to feel comfortable when Nigel's sitting in the cockpit and having a seat moulded around him. It's another thing to feel comfortable when you're sustaining 3.5G through a left-hand corner and your body weight's all being pushed to the right-hand side of the car. So seats um, are changed regularly and Nigel at some point will probably say, I don't like the bump here and we need to do another seat. I think his record actually was uh, to do 10 different seats in one season. But when you think of the sort of G-loading they're undergoing, it's not difficult to see why there's so much work that goes into something like this. The grey-suited visitors seem rather unimpressed, so it's on to the Williams Museum of yesterday's cars. Last year, this was a bustling Honda engine shop filled with Japanese engineers. The older we get, the more cars we're going to have, and the more uh, history becomes significant. But we see here some of the cars that have been important in the life of Williams Grand Prix Engineering. John Cad over there is working on uh, FW06, which is the first... Patrick Head designed Williams that we competed with. That's the car that put us on the map in 78. Very functional, very well laid out, famous really for its excellent traction. Very, very good car on street circuits, for example. Next to that, we have um, one of the ground effect cars that we designed. That's a 1982 FW08. Next to that is our first Honda powered car, the FW09. That car in those colours was actually qualified by Mansell on the first day of the 85 Portuguese Grand Prix. I don't know if it's possible to step over the wheel. Is, is it Interest picks up among the men in grey when Windsor gets to last year's cars. These are the FW11s, which took the team and their sponsors to absolute victory in 1987. And then um, on the right-hand side, there's a little green button with the, the letters OT, which was our code for overtaking. The problem is, these $10 million technological masterpieces are antiques, more useless than a pre-war Mercedes, because Honda won't even let Williams keep last year's engines. We were producing uh, around 1,000 horsepower, the car weighed 540 kilograms, and we were able to get wheel spin in every gear, including sixth, in certain conditions, in the drive. So they were the last of the dinosaurs, if you like, and we'll probably see, not see the like of Grand Prix cars like this uh, for, for Yet as the visitors listen gloomily to Windsor's obsessively detailed stories and the team work on this year's far from successful cars, all minds are on the invisible leader who might save them and their image from humiliation. That leader is Frank Williams. Williams plunged into Formula One at the end of the 60s, armed with ample enthusiasm, no money and a dream. He struggled through four years of indifferent results and slim finances until he was able to introduce his own chassis in 1973, the Iso Marlboro.
The record book, like the balance sheet, showed few visible assets for those years. Yet they proved to be the training ground for success. It was the period that Williams learned that races were won before the starting flag, won in the preparation of the car, won by the communication between the driver and the team. Formula One drivers have to relate the car's performance to the team leader, who diagnoses the problems and calls upon the mechanical doctors to cure them. This film, made in 1980 for Marlboro cigarettes, retells the popular legend of Frank Williams' rise to fame. Modest success began to trickle into the Williams effort, the ESO Marlboro being more competitive than the second-hand machines of the past. There were too many inspired drives that turned into country excursions. Too many times, a helping hand was needed. Frank Williams had enough mechanical and financial worries to crush most constructors. He had been in Grand Prix racing for several years, but had enjoyed few of its rewards. The story bounces along, barely touching on Williams the man. For the sponsors, it Marlboro, it seems to be essential that he remains as heroic and obscure as Alfred Neubauer or Enzo Ferrari, submerged in the legends, the game, and the cars. With that, he was able to hire a young engineer who was to design the Williams cars that would become the standard of excellence in Formula One. Elation in the Williams pits never flagged, as the next car in sight was Regazzoni's. He rolled the car around with the fur that had always been his style. The checkered flag finally fell in front of a Williams car after more than 100 unhappy attempts. A 10-year dream had finally come true. Frank Williams finally had a driver exactly where he had always intended, atop the victory stand. Here, in a short film made for Mobile six years after that first victory, Frank Williams, now a millionaire, tours his new Didcot factory. In Frank, there's a huge amount of repression, there's a huge amount of determination, there is an extraordinary retentive obsessiveness which is dehumanizing and difficult. Uh, I think a man who finds it very hard and always found it very hard to relate to immediate surroundings. An intelligence used almost exclusively in a goal-oriented sense. Are you putting the red line along the top? Red line along the top, yeah. Uh, a man of a very private and burning passion. I think all of this has to go back to childhood. I mean, the absence of a father has to play, being sent away to boarding school has to play, having to make your own way has to play a role. And, of course, that whole terrible debut in motor racing, which was marked by, how could one describe it, except a total lack of success. Uh, you know, it, it reached a point when, when I first came into mot motor racing where Frank was an object of common derision. Uh, Frank was one of the make-up-the-numbers boys. He was known as Wayne. Williams and he was uh, just a figure you saw always an amiable nice hard-working figure you know competent uh, and there are lots of people like that uh, lightning struck and lo he became Jove Williams is Frank Williams and Frank Williams the man is a guy that gets out of bed in the morning and thinks about Formula One and goes to bed at night thinking of Formula One and that it's almost a um, it's certainly not childlike in any way but it's 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 immense in its Patrick Head is the technical genius inside Williams, the engineer SWAT who bestows power on the charismatic leader. Head can still remember the first time he met Frank Williams. He was very neat, dapper, seemed to have a totally unquestioned drive to doing just one thing. I didn't really have the, put the degree of importance on Formula One as he seemed to. He seemed to believe it was the only thing in life. He impressed me for his single-mindedness. If that <clears throat> sounds offhand, it is. The relationship between Head and Williams is respectful rather than warm. For Keith Botsford, it's like a pact between powerful princes. If you talk about 
motor racing manufacturers being baronies, well, inside a motor racing team, there are fiefdoms. And uh, these fiefdoms are occupied by various people who have well-prescribed apartments. Uh, Patrick Head is an autarch who works in his own way for his own ends. Uh, I don't think, you know, that he particularly works out Majorem Gloria Williams. He works for Patrick Head. Frank works because Frank is Frank and wishes to be seen to be Frank and wishes to be a great man. These are very large egos uh, working each for their own benefit in towards some common goal, which, if it succeeds, works it out. Right now, the common goal is to work out why this big British engine is overheating so badly it can't even finish a race. The mechanics battle with the machinery. But like modern warfare, the real struggle is hidden from view. Fought on computer. We can, once you've generated all your pictures on the, uh, on the system, you've got to actually get a hard copy so someone can make it. And this printer uses a hard copy. First thing it uh, does is it goes off and looks for the edge of the paper, and make sure we've got the right size in there. And then it takes the, uh, takes the layout of the model that put into the CAD system and draws it. It's, uh, it's terrific to watch. I wish I could draw this quickly. This is actually a quarter scale version of the full size side pod drawing. This will have some prints made of it for making templates from and go into the model shop to make a quarter scale wind tunnel model. And this side pod will then be tested on the model. And if it's better by enough, we'll make it and fit it to the car. Uh, if it's worse, obviously, it gets discarded. And if it's around about the same, which sadly happens all too often, um, it'll just go into a bin of bits that never get used. In fact, I think on FW12, we made about 14 different side pods. And the, the one we, for the model, the one we made is obviously the best of those. The side pods shroud the radiators. Their shape is critical to the cooling of the car. That's it, ready to go to the model shop. I used to make things in Meccano when I was a child. I used, I think that's a, a good toy. Children should be encouraged to make things because they learn what can and can't happen. So I don't think I've grown up really in that respect. I still enjoy doing now what I liked doing then fiddling with mechanical devices. I just get paid for it now. <laughs> they certainly aren't cars in the sense that you're going to take kids to the seaside in them, but they have an engine and they have wheels and they have controls, and so they are vehicles that are defined with a very specific purpose in the same way that an articulated lorry would be, or a motorized caravan. 
they just happen to have a different function. It's 10.30 in the morning. Frank Williams leaves home for the office. In the end, it was not the exotic 200 mile an hour creations of Patrick Head and Frank Durney that caught up with him, but an ordinary car on an ordinary road. Crack. We were testing at Recar. I mean, you could, <laughs> there's so many ifs about this thing, but in fact, Frank didn't really need to be there. He wanted to be there because it was a test and it was the first time we, we were running the FW11 uh, Honda car and he wanted to be there because the thought of seeing the car at Ricard and, and just being in touch with what was happening uh, was very appealing to him. He was doing a half marathon run the next day back in England and the schedule was to leave Ricard on Saturday afternoon at about 3.30 and drive to Nice airport and fly back to be in England that night. And we left in good time. There was no rush uh, element to it. And it was a beautiful afternoon and Frank was pretty charged up from seeing the car and he's very excited about how well Eleven was going. And he was driving pretty vigorously. I've driven with a reasonable number of racing people now and they all tend to drive quite quickly. Um, and Frank, I knew, had driven uh, well in a number of races. He'd won celebrity races at Brands. He had had a reasonably successful racing career. So in, one tends to learn just to put one's seatbelt on and relax. And if somebody else is driving, they're driving. And um, we, we got into difficulty going through a very fast, I say fast, a, a, a slight kink in the road. And um, it looked like we were just going to go off into a field on the inside. But what we couldn't see from our position in the car was that there was something like an eight foot drop between the road and the ploughed field. And we, of course, the car took off when we went over this drop. And it was inclined down on Frank's side when it uh, left the road, landed nose first in the field and then came down on its roof on Frank's side and the windscreen pillar uh, collapsed and he basically took a vertical blow direct on his head. We came to rest upside down and he said, I can't move, you've got to get me out, get the ignition off because the fuel tank's split, which it had, and there was fuel everywhere. And it took me longer than it should, I think, to get the ignition off because we'd been over two or three times. I was disorientated. It was a left-hand drive car anyway, and the roof had caved in and there wasn't much room to manoeuvre, so I'd have to get my hand round seat belts and briefcases and all that sort of thing to find the ignition. It took a while. And then the number one priority was just to get him out of the car, and the only way I could do that was out the back window. And Frank was very calm, he was conscious throughout, and he was, um, at that stage, he, he, one of his first reactions was to, was to sort of curse and swear and say, I hope this isn't going to mean that I'm not going to get to the Brazilian Grand Prix. Well, I suppose that day was just the inevitable result of 27 years of hooligan driving. Being human, one doesn't realise how seriously you're hurt. I was laying there on the ground while the ambulance came. It took about an hour to get there. I couldn't feel very much except my hands and arms were burning as if I'd fallen off a bicycle and got gravel, you know, from rip, rip the skin off. Um, but over the, over the next few months, one realised that, you know, you're not going to walk again, and that was rather a shame. The bats. <laughs> Frank Williams is quadriplegic. From his shoulders down, he has no control over the functions of his own body. The intricate wiring of his nervous system is snapped and permanently mangled, leaving the moving parts as dead as a broken machine. I'm not actually happy about the sign running at the moment either. I haven't noticed that. But um, we're going to try and get the mobile um, train running on for today as well, so it's on the track for tomorrow. Oh, so what time is David coming tomorrow? 11 a.m. Yeah. Actually, I lied, probably about quarter to 11. Less than six months after the accident, he had ruthlessly forced enough movement into his partly functioning shoulders to push himself along. But his arms are just pistons yeah. of flesh and bone, with no feeling. Swan, which yeah. is, um, MOCL's choice, they use that. They prefer they that to the springs, do they? They prefer it, yeah. Uh, they certainly don't go around with it. 
Yeah. Okay. Relieved about that, of course, for a very long time, but I can't from Bernard this morning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. His struggling engineers couldn't know it, but he has done a deal that might save the honour of his team and its sponsors. I mean, in a way, it's going to be very difficult to handle it, but uh, was, I was offered a, a situation this morning that actually might be a reasonable solution Good. for 1989 at least. Good. Good. Yeah. See. So they've obviously been giving that some thought. Well, they realise that, you know, a deal's a deal. They've got to carry on. Mm. He's talking about Mobil. They have a contract to sponsor Williams for 88 and 89. Lack of racing success is making them twitchy. But worse still, Frank Williams has just done a deal with Renault for exclusive use of their new high-tech 10-cylinder engines for next year. The problem is that Renault have a tie-up with the French oil company Elf and Elf are competitors of Mobil in the battle to dominate the oil market. It's the sort of complicated game Frank Williams has always enjoyed. It's possible. Mm. Anyway, um... In a way, he's, racing has been a crutch for Frank, and because he's been, he's been so involved in racing, he doesn't allow himself to have time to say, aren't I in a bad state, and this is terrible, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? He literally doesn't, I, th I don't think, allows himself to say that, because there are too many meetings he has to get ready for, there are too many decisions that have to be made, there's the next race coming up, there's the next test session, and he's very fortunate that the, the, the functions that he needed to do his job well, i.e. his brain and his voice and his eyesight, uh, are still all there. Brothers and Williams, Sergio Carlo. Brothers, chair. If Mobile were to pull out because of Elf, Williams would need to find another two million pounds to top up their annual twenty million pound budget. Another of their sponsors is Denim, a brand of Unilever. They're based in Italy, and they will need to know about Renault too. Si chiama Basil Hill Road. Anche se vuoi posso mandarlo su Telex. Telex oggi con il nostro indirizzo allora. Grazie. Obviously post Rio and um, temperature situation we had there. After lunch, Peter Windsor is back with the visitors from Mobile. This is the Williams wind tunnel. It has been their secret weapon for six years making Patrick Head's designs among the most aerodynamically efficient racing cars in the world. Intentionally stark and functional, it is used by Windsor as a climax to the day's tour, complete with wind tunnel model car on show to convince the sponsors that a future with Williams is bright. Compensation than on the weight, then. It's got to be, it's quarter scales, is it quarter the weight? Obviously not, but there's no Yeah, but I was wondering what to look at. It's just airflow, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it doesn't have to be a difference. Appropriate. They are kids with very expensive toys. I suppose motor racing people in general are the most intensely competitive people I've ever known. Now, as to Frank getting it right, it would be very hard for Frank not to get it right because Frank cares so bloody much about getting it right uh, that almost certainly, if there's any chance of his getting his act together in some outstanding way, he'll do it. that it, business is very competitive, the arts are no less so, uh, success is important to, to everyone. But I can think of no world or no microcosm in which the desire to be better and to succeed more than somebody else is more prominent and more constant. I don't call them childish, but they are childlike. A lot of them have, I wouldn't call it either arrested development, but a lot of them haven't really grown up entirely because I don't think they have very mature human relations and I think a man has not grown up until he does. Uh, they're not very mature intellectually or culturally because they neither read nor think uh, very much except about what they actually do, to which they think in a, to an extraordinary degree with a concentration that artists could learn a lot from. Mm -hmm. 
The checkered flag was only one of two the Williams team enjoyed at the end of the day. After winning the French Grand Prix in 1980, Alan Jones almost caused a riot by waving the Union flag at the humiliated Renault engineers. Engineers Williams will now have to work with. It's probably the most intense and pressurized sport to the highest stress. And above all, I suppose the final thing, it's the only sport in the world which has a risk of death. from next year's deal with Renault, this year's British V8, connected to its electronic nerve center, pumping its fluids, pushing its pistons, and vibrating with life, shatters the calm of the Williams race shop, like a call to arms. I really enjoy what I do, and I love working with my friends. And I think that um, I have a lot of respect for a lot of people in other teams, but the number of teams that I would consider working with is very, very limited. Frank Durney's friends fuss and listen to the pulse of Patrick Head's temperamental creation. I mean, at times when the difficulties of it are getting to me, I think to myself, well, maybe I should be doing something more worthwhile with my life and designing better ashtrays for road cars or better washing machines or something like that. And the more I think about it, I don't actually think that washing one's clothes slightly whiter is any bit more valuable than uh, uh, making Grand Prix cars that go a little bit faster around the circuit. Williams have lost Honda. Crippled but not dead, they will force themselves through an embarrassing season of failure and next year a new alliance will provide new power. New power will bring new money. New money will bring new toys. Well, I don't regret it because it's happened. I mean, I can't undo anything. I'd certainly, I must confess, I think a lot about you know, losing control and you know, if only the roof had collapsed somewhere else or whatever, but but your number's on it, you know, your number's on it. And so today, I mean, Ian drives me around. I think to myself, oh, God's sake, why are you breaking so early? I mean, I still want to go quick. It hasn't affected that at all. What music have you got? Have you got any good music? Dilip Sylvia, Liszt's Five Symphony, which is the one you told me that the Nazis always played before they had a had an art when Liszt's uh well, yes. you got there. Hi, Preston. How do you doing that, Jimmy Jock? Hello, thanks, Frank. 
Who Biggles under control, is he? Very hard work, isn't it? That new truck. I was going to come and see you, Bob. Yeah. Check out the gearboxes, give you a few tips.